It's time on Legends. You ever wonder just what it is about lever machines that makes them so magical? Well, I've got not one, but two on the shelf. Let's pull them down, dust them off, and I'll give you an engineering walkthrough. I'm Dave Miller, and I sell and service high-end espresso machines. Well, like a crazy person. Specialty coffee is an adventure. It's complex, fascinating, and delicious. In this series, you'll see how special and beautiful our machines can be. All right, now before we get started, I just want to clear the air with some of my Patreon subscribers. I know that some of you have been complaining that Harold's webcam is broadcasting upside down. We know about the issue. It's a software problem. I promise I'm going to get an IT guy in to come take a look at it. I just, I just, it's just one damn thing after another with these computers. But we got pins. Check them out. I've got somebody shipping these out next week. Wait a minute. <sighs> I had the package backward. Can you see these now? This is a 1983 Astoria Sonia lever machine. One of my first builds from eight years ago. Looking back, not much I'd do differently. All right, so obviously I got to make some room on the workbench here. So I'm just going to clear some of these other rebuild projects out of the... Wait a minute, what the hell is that? All right, so when we're talking about lever machines, well, commercial lever machines anyway, there's a few different major types, but the most iconic and the one I've got in front of me here is the CMA lever group installed in this Astoria machine. The vast majority of commercial lever machines are manually applied, spring released. In other words, when you go to pull the lever down, you are setting the spring tension and releasing the lever allows the spring to push the piston down to extract the coffee. So if you've heard of lever machines, you know that they have a cult following, obviously, and that's for several reasons. The first one, and the most obvious one, I guess, is uh, cultural and traditional. Most of the older generation remember these in coffee bars in, in Western Europe. Mo in modern times, they're revered for their pressure characteristics. So the flavors tend to be uh, a bit richer, the mouthfeel is deeper, um, and by and large, they're more forgiving than pump-driven machines. I've actually got a scase meter hooked up to this group so that you can see the extraction curve happening. So as I pull the lever down, and we go into pre-infusion, you can see that there's a very small amount of pressure that happens. And then when we start to release the lever and bring it up, you get a catch point. And it peaks at about 7 bar. And as the extraction evolves, the pressure goes down in a nice gentle curve. And ends at around 3 bar or something like that. Now I'm just going to run another shot so you can see that if I want to reduce the pressure during the shot, here's our catch point, all I got to do is impede the lever's travel back to the top and you can immediately have an effect on the pressure while the shot is pulling. So the extraction mechanism is really simple and I've just removed the fairing so that I can pull this group out and show you. There's four through bolts holding the uh, the top of the group into the cylinder and once you've removed them it's a fairly simple matter to get it out. Pull it straight up and out it comes. All right so now that it's on the bench you can see that spring that we've been talking about here. Here's the piston okay? and I've just included this portafilter here just so you can get some sort of a sense of where we're oriented in space here. Okay. Move that out of the way. Now this is going to be really difficult to show you because obviously this is a pretty strong spring. So when we pull the lever forward, you can see the piston rises slightly. Okay, that's what what's happening. We're compressing the spring by moving the lever forward. Here's the liner or the cylinder that this piston lives in. It's just like that. Okay. And this is a separate component that's pressed into the group. And if you look really closely, you'll see that we've got some infusion holes right here. And they are lined up to sit right about here. So you can see that the reason that you've got these two U-cups facing each other is because they are trying to trap the water in the infusion chamber right here. So when you pull it back and the piston rises, it uncovers those ports and water is allowed to infuse into the chamber above the basket and the portafilter. Now the flow of water through the group itself is r extremely simple uh, and hopefully it's starting to make a bit more sense to you now. Here is the liner that I showed you earlier. 
Here is the bore that the piston lives in. You can see the portafilter handle right here. Um, and then looking right down into the bottom of the group is the shower screen. And below that is the portafilter basket, of course. And if you look closely inside the group, you'll see a droplet of water at the pre-infusion holes right there. And that is where water enters the group when you pull the piston upward by pulling down the lever. And so from the boiler, uh, which doesn't have any heat exchangers on this particular model, um, it enters the group from a dipper tube that uh, sits down underneath the level of the water inside the steam boiler. Uh, this cover here has a check ball underneath it that simply allows the water to flow in one direction but not the other. Um, in the more modern versions of this group, this cap actually has an adjuster screw that allows you to adjust the flow rate of water entering the group so that you can control kind of the saturation rate of the coffee bed during pre-infusion. Now on the temperature side of things, well, that's the bad news. You know, these machines really were not designed to be all that precise. Um, and, you know, I've heard tell of people putting like damp cold cloths over the group to try and reduce the temperature. You know, if you're going to spend any kind of time trying to counteract that, you're, you're really barking up the wrong tree. In commercial service, it's just not practical or repeatable. There's, of course, exceptions to the rule. Some manufacturers take the basic group and make modifications to them uh, so that they'll perform better. And if they're attached to a heat exchanger as opposed to a dipper tube, and especially in a case where a flush valve has been installed, that can certainly help with keeping the group at a more appropriate temperature. All right, want to see me make some coffee with it? Well, maybe you don't, but it's going to happen. Oh, just kidding. And there it is. Maybe not my best performance or my best latte art, but that is a latte that was prepared entirely off of propane gas. The gas burner is definitely my favorite part of these machines. So quick fuel flow walk through here uh, from your cylinder. You have your LP gas regulator. I call them vaporizer just because we've got two regulators on here and it eliminates confusion. And here's your fuel hose. It enters right here. There is a ball valve that's used as a shutoff right here. So here it's open, here it's closed. Here is your pressure tap for checking the uh, regulated pressure from your vaporizer. And then from there, it goes to what's called a safety shutoff. And this is a device that is designed to shut off the flow of fuel to your regulator in the event that the flame is snuffed out. From the safety shutoff, it goes to your regulator and there's two adjustments here. This is your basically your idle flame size and then this will adjust your equilibrium point at which the uh, steam pressure will throttle the regulator back and cut the flame down to idle. And what's happening here is it's taking its pressure reading from uh, a tube that goes to the bottom of the sight glass. So it's a uh, completely analog system. There's no electricity or electronics involved at all. 
you know, theoretically you could operate this out in the middle of a public park if you wanted to cater a wedding or something, because all you really need as an energy source is your gas bottle. But you won't see this system on a multi-boiler machine because the second that you go to pull a shot, the pressure is going to change. Um, so if you wanted to do that, I suppose, uh, you'd have to use a digital temperature controller and electronic gas valve, which would obviously take up quite a bit more space. So here is the business end of the burner. Behind this fitting lives a gas jet that governs the maximum flame size. And then this adjustable aperture goes back and forth. And this airspace dictates the air and fuel mixture. Uh, and therefore the emissions. And when I'm talking about emissions, any kind of a device that consumes propane or natural gas is gonna create carbon monoxide. And so the air fuel mixture is extremely important uh, to prevent people from getting uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. So at least once a year, I recommend that someone take a, an air-free CO reading of the gas coming out of the top it's the exhaust gas is coming out and for that I use this combustion analyzer so here is the wand or sniffer and you basically just place this right on top of the grate and turn this on and it will uh, aspirate some of the exhaust gas into the machine and tell you what your CO reading is that's basically how it's done well that's all I got on lever machines this time they're old school, they're cool, and if yours doesn't have a gas burner, go pass out on a front porch somewhere. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. If you're a Patreon supporter, I will see you in the Plutonium Plus Contributors Clubhouse with some exclusive footage of my whole family riding around the backyard on motorized carts, and a location shoot of Harold's last trip to the vet. You will not believe where they took his temperature.